I don't know if we've talked about this one already, um, but we could probably talk about it again if we, <laughs> since it's we one have of those talked th- about it. <laughs> <laughs> I meant on tape <laughs> or whatever that is. One bite, it's one bite. Well, which is, you know, role of family in practice, right? You know, probably mm-hmm. most of us. Uh, are not living in situations where uh, everybody in the family is on the same page in terms of practice. That can, we aren't monks either. We're not monks. And, uh, you know, we value our work in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, nonetheless, it seems like for a lot of people, there's, you know, that one of the last uh, real big challenges uh, that they face as they're kind of withering their narrative mind is the narrative mind whose content is family, you know, mm-hmm. taking care of the kids, uh, making sure the spouse is happy. And, uh, you know, apropos our other discussion, you know, how is it that we can kind of work with that, you know, to make that a really productive site rather than the way in which I see it happening a lot of times where people then start to resent or distance themselves from their family or feel like, oh, I need to go to a monastery or something, rather than seeing that actually right here is maybe some of your most important practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've all, uh, in different guises, whether you're married or not married, whatever that means, uh, to you, um, that comes up a lot. And with a long-term partner, they have discovered over the course of years, if it's these years, how to push every button that you have. I mean, nobody knows you as well as your, if you have kids, your kids or your your partner does. And they do know how to um, wound you and you them over the course of time. And so it can be a very difficult thing to uh, unwind yourself from and keep your uh, process moving forward. Um, I know in my case, it was, it's been a very powerful, I've been saying my book, the very powerful teachers. My kids and my wife have been very strong. Uh, none of them are really into this. And so um, that creates some, some friction and some chances for uh, understanding. But um, you're, there's no, no stronger Zen master than your kids or your wife to point out to you where you really do need to do work. Something that if you go to go to Sashin or something in a Zen retreat where you spend eight days or seven days with somebody, uh, and he shouts at you for seven days. He doesn't have any idea exactly where you are compared to what your kids and your spouse do. So very valuable teachers. I always find it to be the case, and um, a distinction that uh, popped up for me, I don't remember how it you know, manifested, but distinction that... Uh, I really had to work through was the the distinction between love and attachment Mm -hmm. that um, part of, I I found that part of the challenge that I was facing all the time is that it felt like what it meant for me to love my family was for me to be attached to them. Right. In other words, that there's some particular outcome that needs to come there, that there needs to be a narrative that meshes for all of them. Right. So that my story meshes my, matches my wife's story, matches my kid's story. Uh, And that seems like the most obvious thing in the world that that's true, you know, when you're inside of a family context, precisely because in order for there to be that long-term relationship, those buttons have been learned how to push, Mm -hmm. be pushed. So what you're doing is you're all evolving stories that allow you to push each other's buttons in different orders, and then sometimes the the, the pushing of the buttons kind of, you know, wounds more than it should, mm-hmm. right? Um, but I found then the distinction between love and attachment to be very helpful there because I realized that what I was thinking of as love was as much attachment mm-hmm. as it was love, where love is actually the surrender of the personal narrative uh, in in the context of the other as opposed to the imposition of the personal narrative. And so the, you know, it was probably, I don't know, it happened four or five years ago, but you know, it's still, I'm still working it through, but it always is useful for me when I can ask myself, I can query myself and say, am I acting out of attachment 
or am I acting out of love? Am I feeling attachment or am I feeling love? And the more I do it, the more I see that that kind of letting go happens much more, more quickly, right? Like, it, like, like even in a term of, of a few seconds, right. uh, it can happen. And it gives you a, a, basically a supplemental method of self-inquiry mm-hmm. because it allows you a particular phrasing to look back and see how am I, you know, encountering this? Who is encountering this? If there's somebody there that has a story about how this needs to go, then that's a somebody. Right. And <laughs> somebody to work on. Whereas when I do that, what's interesting, what can, what can sound distressing is that saying, oh, well, well, you know, if you undermine that, then there's not going to be any bond. But, you know, as we've discussed, right to the contrary, because the attachment is actually hiding the love that is there. The love has given rise to the attachment in a certain way because the eye comes in mm-hmm. and wants to sort of like direct the love right. because love is scary to the eye. Right. But when you can wither the attachment, more love can manifest. And then you end up more or less just being there for the other person. Now, something that can be painful about that is, is that you can see the way in which maybe the other person or person's are not so much there, uh, right. and, and that that itself can present its own challenges. But um, then another uh, a word comes up, and it's, <laughs> and it's acceptance that you that as the attachment withers and the love grows, not only is love conducive to a kind of surrender of the personal narrative, love, love's also conducive to acceptance. That, you know, that's just how he or she is. And that's just who they are. And no amount of my creation of a story about them, about how they need to change, is going to affect that. And then the miracle is, of course, as soon as you stop trying to impose change on them and you just accept them for who they are and don't react to their buttons or try to push their buttons, there's movement. Well, we've we've talked... Uh, it can be uh, difficult at first. I mean, if you've if you've lost attachment, if you get, there's less and less of a you there than I there, then what happens is you won't be responding to the buttons the same way you used to. And and that can be uh, disconcerting for the relationship because, you know, they're used to having you react a certain way to certain stimuli. And if you've been together a long time, that's a very well-established pattern. It's not written down, uh, written down, but... But it is uh, there, and they know the program, and you know the program. So those programs are running, and if you start don't respond the way you're su- supposed to, then it's like, what's wrong? You know, what am I doing wrong that's happening in the relationship now because he isn't responding the way he used to respond? And that can lead to some unhappiness because they think, you know, what's going on? There's some problem here. When in fact, if you keep in that space, as you know, if you just keep coming from that space then the other person will learn, in fact, hey, the old buttons aren't working. The old algorithms don't work anymore. So something's changed here. And there's a possibility, not by you telling them to change, but just by them recognizing the game has changed. And so then they will find themselves looking internally. And not because you tell them to do, you should do this, you're more, be more spiritual. Watch my video. Watch my video. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, they will find that they're moving into a different space as well. Yeah. And so it doesn't, I mean, the worst thing you can do in my, in my experience is to proselytize or tell them you should be like me or you should be, it just doesn't work that way. That's the last thing that's effective. I mean, you've got to be very still yourself and the more quiet you get and the less attached you are, as you were saying, the more chance there is for them to begin to understand themselves and learn their way out of their algorithms that they've been using that we help them create. But at first, as you mentioned, or, you know, even for quite some time, when the buttons are pushed and it doesn't work, then they're pushed again <laughs> mm-hmm. and again. And maybe like, you know, the buttons are pushed with more intensity. You know, it's like you <laughs> exactly. see people on an elevator, you know, exactly. like it's not exactly. here yet. You know? exactly. uh, and so like, uh, 10 times when they can help faster. And again, that is a real teaching, right? Because it's like, maybe you've withered your self response. You, you, you've, you've cultivated your self inquiry enough 
You can say, oh, you know, not reacting. Right? You know, the button is pushed, but then it's pushed again. Right. And it's pushed again. Right. And in a way, again, it's a gift because then you find like, ah, there's my limit. Mm-hmm. Right. It got pushed again or it got pushed exactly at the right time or it got pushed in this sequence with these other buttons. And it's as if it's, you're being given the wiring diagram for your own kind of emotional attachments. Right. And so you can see it, like you can feel the shock. Uh, and then that's, again, a gift. So this is why, uh, at least in my experience, the the best you know progress comes not from you know, leaving society and going into oh, seclusion, right. but by being with uh, the everyday, you know, the challenges of everyday life, which are really can be the best teachers of all, as, you, as you've said, but I, you know, I've experienced that. One of Krishnamurti's quotes that I always like was, you only see yourself in relationship. Now, Virginia Woolf famously said, you know, we have as many eyes as we have relationships. And so you, you need to, need to whatever, your situation is such that you have a lot of situations with kids or, or wife, whatever, that you are put face to face with those relationships. You do get to understand facets of yourself because different eyes show up for each relationship. And so those will unwind separately and you will begin to see that, in fact, they are not glued together as one thing. They really are relationship indexed. Right. So you actually have to, at some level at least, unwind each of them independently there is no just the deconstruction of quote unquote the I right. because of this phenomenon that the I emerges as different facets of what you are in relation with all the different kinds of experiences and worlds that you dwell in. Right, but it's very helpful yeah. it, to, to see that in fact I am 70 different relationships. There is not one I there. You can just see the I change each time. That's why you do this, this when am I exercise and you look and say, well, I'm one person here, one person there, one person. So there is no continuity to this eye. It's just an ad hoc entity that comes racing into that particular relationship. And as you change, as your eye gets unwound, and whatever all those are, or, or the base gets unwound, then in fact the relationships change, necessarily. And, and you do get to see, and I know you've seen this as well, that you see the other person maybe for the first time in a long, long time. I mean, with no attachment. You just see them as somebody else... I'm just trying to get through the day, but somebody yeah. else trying to live their life as as a, best best they can, and they're really struggling to do that, and you're struggling too, whatever. And and so you watch that, you say, oh, now you begin to get real empathy for the other person, yeah, with no attachment, just clear seeing that in fact, I see them for the beauty that they are, with no judgment. Well, and you see them as aspects. Of the one, the one that you're discovering. Right, exactly.